Hello, I'm Joshua and I'm an INTP and first and foremost I would like to say thank you for viewing this video and subsequently visiting my channel. The topic of this video is going to be on madness and creativity and the reason I want to talk about this topic is because there's a growing and in, in increasing trend in um, create, creativity research to um, divorce creativity or I would say shoehorn creativity into the research of a certain school of thought called positive psychology. And, and given the fact that a lot of the early research that, uh, early modern research that went into the study of creativity from a scientific and neuroscience, and neuroscience uh, excuse me, I should say a modern psychological perspective and a neuroscientific perspective was spearheaded by two individuals, one being Hans Eysenck and the other being, um, at least most famously, Hans Eysenck and the other being Mihai Chinksink Mihai. Now, I don't know the intricacies of the literature and its evolution over time prior to the, that point, but the, that's in, these two individuals are important because they published several books and papers that influence basically the constructs of creativity and how research is done in creativity as well as how research is done in the study of genius. It is in fact the remodeling of Isaac's um, personality model that the Big Five is centered around just rearranged and includes other factors and traits. What Isaacs would call schizotypy is segmented up into openness to experience and neuroticism, though Isaacs did have neuroticism as a part of his model. But the reason I'm mentioning these individuals is because they led to two different veins in creativity research. Now, for what Mihai Chinksink Mihai is most known for is his work in the study of flow and positive experience. So Mihai Chinksink Mihai was um, influenced by Carl Jung um, and uh, Viktor Frankl and many of the phenomenological psychologists that came around uh, about at, at the end of the 20th century. And so um, his work is more in line with their thinking, but uh, Mihai Chinksink Mihai tends towards more of an attitude of positivism. He's more an optimistic thinker and was literally trying to do research on the science of happiness, positive experience, and creativity because he saw creativity as a vehicle for uh, basically taking the, uh, I guess, um, vein of thinking of Maslow and seeing create in Bloom, you know, in Bloom's taxonomy and everything like that, Bloom and Maslow, the psychologists, uh, Bloom and Maslow, and saying that creativity is a fundamental aspect to self-efficacy, uh, fulfillment, and positive experiences. And so he wanted to understand what that really meant, and thus he wanted to see what the connectivity was between happiness, creativity, and, and creativity and what people describe as positive experiences, um, not just simply happiness, but joy and things like that. And what leads to these things and how can we understand them from a much more analytic perspective or empirical perspective than we once had. And so Mihai Chinksink Mihai looked at everything from work hours to happiness, um, money earned as it pertains to people's levels of uh, life satisfaction and various things like that. And it's through this research of looking for positive experience and what typifies positive experiences and the factors that lead to positive experiences that he stumbled upon the neuro um, logical phenomena of flow. And he saw that the neurological phenomena of flow was something that was very much so intimately related to creativity or whenever he looked at, so there are two studies on creative geniuses that were really seminal. Hans Eysenck published a book, I'm pretty sure, on genius or on creativity. That was one. Took one approach. Um, 
and Mihai Chingsink Mihai took the uh, took a, his own approach, and so. But both of them, and they're not the only one, so I can't really name all of the psychologists off off the top of my head that have been looking at creativity from... So they're... Okay, so because there's a, a multitude of ways to look at creativity. We basically get the trait approach to creativity and the personality approach to create to understanding creativity from Hans Isaac, Dean Keith Simonton, and a lot of other people, even if they ascribe to positive psychology, their research methods very much so model or are at least deriving or borrowing from the framework of Isaacs. Is one of the most no, no, notorious, not in a negative way, so I should say, I should, he's just one of the most influential psychologists of the 21st century um, in terms of psychological research, maybe not in terms of pipes, pop psychology. Maybe people know about Hans Isaac, maybe they don't, but he was extremely influential. Um, or there was trying to understand personality from a phenomenological approach and personality in another way, which was Mihai Chinksink Mihai's approach. So Mihai Chinksink Mihai is also the person who, I mean, I'm not, sh I don't think that he actually came up with case studies or something like that. That's something that's been around in philosophy. It was something that Galton did. It was, I mean, like it's been around for since the dawn of psychometrics, at least, or even philosophy. So knowledge starts in all sorts of places. But um, Mihai Chinksik, Mihai discovered flow and um, what the creative personality was, basically, from uh, case studies and different psychometric batteries, basically. But um, part of the newest research in creativity and seeing its tie to openness to experience, it comes from the fact of positive psychologists taking Isaac's tools and the recent developments within personality theory and neuro science and cognitive science and applying them to the field of positive psychology. And so there has been a great deal of new insights and things that we understand about creativity. In fact, I'll pull it off of my shelf. So um, Abraham, uh, God damn it, uh, hold on. Anna Abraham even has um, published the neuroscience of creativity and this has really only been possible because of things that have happened you know within the last 20 to 30 years it's not very i mean uh, it's not very old and i mean possible in the sense that this stuff has only been coming out within the last 10 to 15 years but the groundwork for the actual things to be discovered and done has been moving for past 20 or 30 years which is not actually a very very long time so um yeah with that said because creativity is kind of bifurcated between two schools of thought um it's not completely like that because even the positive psychologists everything's updating itself so it's not as crudely dichotomized as the way that i'm putting it but part of the thing from a philosophical standpoint that is clearly dichotomized from my standpoint is this so for a long time, it's been the case that people have thought that there was an association between madness and creativity, or madness and genius, okay? So this goes back even as far as Plato. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to guess what I'm going to say next, but you may guess that the positive psychologists are definitely changing this narrative. Now, I said this on a Quora post, and I've commented this on a YouTube video that was talking about um, art, creativity, and madness, and all these other things, that it's very much so something that's happening in science right now, that people are trying to distance creativity from the negative, I guess, aspects it was once associated with, for whatever reasons. Now, I wouldn't say that positive psychology as a psychological discipline is trying to say that there's no connection between madness and creativity because I'll say what I said in this comment. If a scientist is being honest, what they will tell you is that it's ultimately 
inconclusive and it's a lot more complicated than simply saying madness and creativity are related or associated. It's a lot more complicated than that because, well, I'll get into why it's like that. But what they'll say is, is it's inconclusive. However, I think because people who are drawn to positive psychology, <laughs> such as Scott Barry Kaufman and various other individuals, are much more interest. They're much more extroverted and open, and they like positive ideas. And everybody, <laughs> I think there's a certain personality that's drawn to the field in the first place that biases other psychologists to say, or at least present the idea that madness and creativity don't have any association whatsoever. And I don't, I'm not saying Scott Barry Kaufman has said that or anything like that, but positive psychologists or people who are within the field of positive psychology have gone so far to, as to say that there is no connection between madness and creativity. And that's not true. So the only thing you can say at best, if you're trying to be as skeptical as you can be in terms of just sticking with the evidence, is that there is just inconclusive. There's not anything to say yay more so one way than the other because it's actually a very, very complicated problem. And it's actually something that can be analyzed from very, very many vantage points. Because, for example, so going back to Mihai Chengsink Mihai and Hans Eisenks, we had not uh, mapped out the human genome at that point in time. We're still not done with, you know, our study in uh, genomics and everything like that. But it's the case that, you know, that's not, that wasn't a, uh, that's not, that wasn't a reality or something like that. But um, it's the case that now in our modern time, we do. And so, and also we did not have fMRIs, you know, except for at least like 20 years ago. So, um, I think we got FR fMRIs in the early to mid 90s. So, uh, we've not had them for at least more than 30 years. That's definitely not the yeah, at least no more than 30 years. It's not even close to that. It's somewhere around 20 years, like 20 mid uh, fMRIs are in their mid 20s in terms of their use in um, neuroscience and cognitive science uh, research. And so there is just, we found a lot of different ways to study and think about creativity. We know how to think about creativity as it pertains to genetics and the biological aspect of creativity. We know from Isaacs and Mihai Chengsink Mihai to look at it from the standpoint of personality and all others and in cases in creative individuals so um, personality in terms of creativity in terms of how it is associated with personality on an individual level. Um, we know how to think of creativity from the neuroscientific and cognitive science standpoint. Now neuroscience is mostly interested in the actual molecular micro well it's interested in the macro scale but it's it's more so what is the anatomy and physiology of the brain doing that results in how cognition um, works to where cognitive science is more so about it's a it's a tier up where it's asking well we may not need to know what causes the effects but what, how do the effects interact in more complicated ways and lead to our ability to do things like make moral judgments and things like that? So they're not as, they know the neuroscience, but they're not as interested in the neuroscience. And so that has its own consequences for whenever you're asking about, you know, the cognitive science of creativity and things like that. There's a difference between the neuroscience of creativity and the cognitive science of need creativity. And so because there are all these different ways you can slice the thing up, there's a lot of competing research and there's not really any way to um, uh, unify them for the mere fact that creativity doesn't actually have a definition, a working definition in psychology. There are definitions that various people use like what in terms of what creativity means, but nobody can decide on any one thing. 
And it's also the case that in terms of our constructs as it pertains to creativity, my critique about, uh, about const the construct of creativity in psychology is that it's too narrow. So, I mean, or that people, so I, for one, I think I've said this in a lot of other videos, do not think that creativity is a trait or something like that. I think it's much more something of an emergent phenomenon that it has a lot of things to do with various factors like personality and um, uh, cognitive ability and um, environment and things like that. But I don't think it's as straight as, I don't think it's as straightforward as um, a trait. Um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons too why it's kind of frayed like that because there's not any real way you can sum the pieces together from the competing standpoints that people are looking at. And it's also the case too that because we're able to look at a whole host of other things from various standpoints like personality disorders and um, the genetics of personality disorders, we have it the case that we can see various relationships between certain cognitive factors like rem uh, remote association and divergent thinking in the populations of individuals that um, have various kinds of mood disorders that are along the schizophrenic uh, continuum. There is a continuum for schizophrenia and the bipolar mood disorder continuum, type one or type, type one or type two, and there's a lot of schizo disorders, okay? But mania is associated with all of them. But one of the thing that you know about um, all of them too is that they all have a s interesting uh, relationship with genes that deal with dopaminergic regulation. And two, that if you give these individuals like remote association tasks and things like that, they will score highly on them, depending. So it depends on what kind of schizophrenic you're dealing with and things like that. So there are different features to schizophrenia. So there are different kinds of schizophrenics and things like that. So it's not a truism or anything like that, but it's the case that you do find these things. And then it's also the case that because creativity is something that can be applied to different domains, meaning... You can be a highly creative writer, you can be a highly creative musician, you can be a highly creative uh, actor, you can be a highly creative mathematician, you can be a highly creative physicist, you can be a highly creative chemist, you can be a highly creative anything except for maybe like a lawyer or an accountant or something like that or a judge or somebody like that. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, it just it doesn't seem like the personalities that go towards those fields allow for those things. So maybe police officers can be highly creative. I doubt it you know, or firefighters, I doubt it. But you know, it's just like, again, it's what's your definition of creativity. My thing about creativity is you produce something that's novel and useful. And it doesn't matter really where you do it. It's just you change something about the way in which things are done. That's different than anything else that's come around and other people seem to find it very very useful and they start adopting that thing that means that's creativity to me or at least how it manifests itself in a way that's measurable and observable and that's not exactly different than the idea of uh, creative inventory so it's also too because there's a lot of different ways to measure creativity in terms of what people associate with creativity from Cognitive factors like diver divergent thinking or remote association, um, which all have something to do with the science, the neuroscience of flow and things, like, especially with um, uh, divergent thinking. Uh, no, not excuse me, remote association and um, uh, insight and um, transient hypofrontality. All of those things have a very strong connection from a neurological standpoint and Transient hypofrontality is something that is fundamental to the flow state, but the flow state is a lot more complicated than transient hypofrontality from a, neuro, a neuroscientific perspective. And so it's the case that, um, you know, because there are all these competing veins of, because scientists are like, is like, science is like an ant colony that doesn't exactly communicate with itself. So 
there is one side of all these worker ants and there's another side of these worker ants. All right, so it's like ant colonies that live, they're connected terrestrially, meaning they have, they all hail from the same queen and things like that. Like they're related, but they live miles and miles and miles and miles apart such that they don't actually ever communicate or interact or associate with one another. So it's not like, so maybe neuroscientists and cognitive scientists talk to one another and things like that. I don't know. It just seems, it looks like it's so segmented. If you, From my perspective, whenever I look at the thing, it just looks like this is a different philosophical position than this one. Because whenever I look at the way in which people are thinking about creativity, I think, well, look, if creativity, well, so, you know, people, I've already said what I think about creativity, but when you measure creativity as a trait, then you're saying it's something that's similar to IQ. So to me, like whenever you look at the um, trait uh, view of creativity, then that's something that's based off of personality and IQ, because personality is something that's actually easier to measure than not. Not everything does a good job at measuring it, but it's easier to measure than not. Similar with IQ, not the best measurement. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that or the only measurement or something like that. I'm just saying it's the easiest way to do it. And it's pretty damn reliable. At least you know what you're going to get. So that's part of the reason why those things are popular um, from a scientific standpoint. But why one assumes that, you know, creativity is like those other two things is beyond me. Creativity is a lot more like personality. There's several factors that lead to it. But all of those factors may not be things that can be associated with one another from an affective standpoint. So personality is an affective phenomenon. It's a result of the way your cognition works and the emotional landscape that's you know going on in your brain. And so um, that influences your mind. So that's that's what that's what it is. So I mean, and it's ubiquitous across nature. Now this where this is also too where it gets to be a little dicey because you know when people are talking about creativity and their definitions of things and everything like that, and you have an interesting, um, um, you have an outer science non scientific community community that's interested in creativity from a spiritual standpoint or something like that. There's a lot of there's a lot of noise out there as it pertains to creativity. A lot of a lot of stuff, and so. Because it's like this, the information is very disparate. Not meaning that it's not, it's not talking about the same thing. So I'll put it like that. So just because something has creativity in its name doesn't mean it's all talking about the same thing. Because it's usually not, even if you have two people talking about creativity. Because the neuroscience of creativity and understanding creativity from a trait standpoint and understanding it from an experiential standpoint or a phenomenological one in the sense of, you know, what does it take for somebody to be creative or something like that are all very, 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 very different vantage points. They may be talking about the same general thing from the standpoint that people have a, con a conception of what it means to be creative, but from each of their vantage points, there is no way you could arrive to the conclusions that one person arrives at from this vantage point from this other one. All the conclusions that each of them arrive at, it's just like three different people touching different parts of the elephant that's very distinct. So one person has an ear, one person has a trunk, one person has a tusk. It's like they wouldn't say that they're... If you know you're talking about an elephant, then you could say, sure... But if you closed your eyes and you grasped, you would think that they're very different things. And so that's how creative cre research and creativity looks to me. It's like that, where, you know, if you didn't know you people were talking about the same thing from a philosophical standpoint, it's all very, 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 very different from one another. And so let's talk about some of the consequences of this as it pertains to creativity and madness, because I guess like as you could see, that from various vantage points, you're going to find that there is an association between creativity and madness. And other vantage points, you're not going to find that there is any association. Um, and that's just seems what it that's what it seems like. That's just what it seems to be right now. And I'm not, I'm not saying I've exhaustively read all the literature or anything like that. I stay up to date on create 
research and creativity, but that's about the only thing I can manage to keep up with right now as it pertains to psychology. Some things about depression and various other topics, but I mean, like, I'm not, not about, like, a lot of other things. I don't, I don't do it with most other things, so. I really wouldn't know where intelligence research has gone in the last five years or something like that. But, so, can't tell you. But, I mean, it's which why I'm not talking about it. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, but when it comes to creativity, I can keep up with that one because it's a lot easier. In fact, I have a whole book on it. Like, I have at least more than one book on it, so... A lot easier. So my point, anyways, my point being that, um, yeah, so for example, whenever you look at creativity from a case studies, in terms of case studies, so most people consider artists creative, <laughs> you know, um, and so when people look at artists, they wonder, well, you know, we're going to look at artists and we're, well, so one of the things that's interesting about like prior to all of this business with Mihai Chinksink, Mihai, and um Hans Isaac. I'm not really sure who the researcher was who did this study, but he took people who people consider creative from the standpoint of creative achievement and he gave them different psychometric batteries, ones that are testing them for psychopathologies and ones that are testing them with positive um psychological attributes or features so like well-being and um, um things like that and w what he found was what's very strange about creative people is that they test very high for psych psychopathological um aspects um negative personality aspects as if they have personality disorders while at the same time, they test very highly for positive psychological aspects. Um, they tend to be very thoughtful, kind, and all other sorts of things like that. And so things that you would normally associate with positive psychology, they very much so exemplify those things. And things that you would associate with um, uh, psychosis or psychopathy, they very much so exemplify those things at the same time. Which he didn't know what that meant. He didn't know what to do with it. And it's honestly a confusing thing. And it's a similar kind of result that Mihai Chinksink Mihai came up with because he said the number one thing that can describe a creative person is complexity. They're just complex. They have relatively competing uh, traits and factors of their personality interacting with themselves all the time. They can be both introverted and extroverted where it seems like they are really both introverted and extroverted not being one or the other in very strong ways so not being an ambivert so he wasn't talking about ambiversion or ambiverts or anything like that he was saying that look whenever you're dealing with creative people it's just not in clean slice of dichotomies and in fact, things that seem dichotomous in most other personalities that you would not find together are something you find with creative people, which is why I think that there is a real thing as a creative personality, you know, this con a constellation of certain personality dimensions that, you know, only creative people are going to be like this because, well, and that's why I keyed in on openness and eroticism and things like that, because that's just what seems to make sense. So... Anyways, there's more reasons, but I mean, just from, okay, anyways, um, I'll put it like this. Yeah, and so that's something that Mihai Chink Sink Mihai found as well, that whenever you're looking at creative people, it's not like it's straightforward. And so um, whenever, and so yeah, and why, do I, why did I bring this up? Okay, so yeah, and so whenever you're looking at the case study standpoint, it doesn't look like from the history of, I guess, the research and the literature that there is an aversion to the idea that there may be a connection between madness and creativity. And so in one another study, some because people consider artists creative people, people took visual artists and performing artists and looked to see things like how much. I, and it's not just like based off of hunches or anything like that. It's basically based off of the biography of creative individuals. Everybody knows Ernest Hemingway drank. Everybody knows Virginia Woolf liked herself some of the sauce. People, well, I don't know if everybody knows, but it's just the case that 
The first thing people do is they put on their Galton hat and they turn to the biography of in eminent individuals and then they think, that's where I'm going to use some of the clues to figure out, well, what's going on with these individuals. And so, and I suppose too, if you spend enough time around writers and musicians and things like that, you notice that they tend to like the sauce. Um, it's just like they do. <laughs> Not, you know, physicists aren't very different <laughs> see, either. I mean, like, you know, um, neither are, I mean, I don't know about mathematicians. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm the only person that will down a shot to think better, but I mean, you know, or to just loosen up my mind or something like that. I mean, yeah, I've already commented on the fact that I use, um, psychedelic drugs and everything, not regularly, but casually and occasionally I do. And I like to use things like that. I like drugs. So I'm a druggie, not exactly like a drug head, but I'm a drug user. Anyways, that's something that people find um, consistent with creative people in general, or at least they had a reason to think that. So people got a bunch of visual and uh, visual and performing artists. I mean, the only reason why I hesitate using that category is because this was also done with writers. In fact, this was specific. This was once done with artists in general, and then this was specifically done with writers, and then as it was done with writers, they also looked at their relationship to um, the personality dimension of neuroticism. And so, and Dean T Keith Simonton, too, did his own research on um, creativity as it propagates across domains, which I'm also going to draw from. So, in this study with artists in general, they found that, you know, it's honestly depends on who you're talking about. So when you look at writers, visual artists, they tend to like the sauce more and they tend to have more. So I don't think in this study they actually looked at the individual's relationship to um, neuroticism, but they looked at their relationship to um, uh, mood disorders. And one of the things that they found was whenever you're dealing with musicians, writers, um, I'm pretty sure it's all visual artists and, you know, not necessarily, and some correlation with performing artists. So actors and various other ones, you do find that there is a higher proportion of individuals with um, personality disorders, particularly bipolar mood disorder within those fields. And you find that also there is a higher tendency for those individuals to be alcoholics. Not saying that everybody's in the in those domains and things like that. They're those things, but that's something that you tend to find. Now, that's not saying that, you know, creative people are necessarily alcoholics or creative people necessarily have personality disorders, but it is saying something. Well, I would just say this, that it does show that, look, at least for whatever writing is, whatever performing arts is or something like that, it can select for a very uh, for a personality that is more associated with what we would classically consider madness than not. Now that's true, and this study was done again specifically with writers, and it was still looking at alcoholism, but then it was looking at depression, um, bipolar mood disorder, and um, uh, neuroticism because. People thought, you know, why don't we just deal with them all? Because it's they all are. Because if somebody was thinking about anxiety, just anxiety and anxiety disorders and everything like that. And you do find that artists are like way. So when you look across, so I don't know if this has been done with other people. No, actually, yeah. Dean Keith Simonton did this with other people. So I'm not gonna mix the research, but this has been done with others. But in this study, nobody did it. But the truth, but the way it looked is that. Look, when you're talking about performing artists and things like that, they may be extroverted and all sorts of sorts, sorts of things like that, or writers or something like that, but they all seem to be neurotic, like, or more neurotic than, you know, your average person. It's not saying that everybody's like that, but it just seems there's a greater propensity for that kind of temperamental makeup to show up within those fields. And you have a much higher likelihood to deal with depression like alcohol or be an alcoholic as a writer than you do as many other things and i'm not really sure why you also if you're an actor you may be bipolar so i'm not saying that that's a thing but it's just like you find them there more than not so which is 
surprising because you don't find them other places. It's not like you don't have bipolar physicists or something like that. It's just that it's not the norm. So that's not what you typically see. And it's not exactly the norm with writers. It's just the case that it's very much so evident that it's much more likely there than it is in other areas or arenas. And, I'll, and I guess I'll explain why I think that that's the case and you know how that has something to do with modernity and a whole lot of other things. But moving on past that point, now let's talk about Dean Keith Simonton's research on the very same thing. So what Dean Keith Simonton was looking at was neuroticism as it um, plays itself across fields and its core... Actually, Dean Keith Simonton was looking at neuroticism and pathology, psychopathology. So <laughs> he was looking for them both. And he was he looked across all he looked across a lot of different fields. So visual artists, performing artists, scuba divers, um, extreme sport athletes, physicists. He covered the gambit. So one of the things that he found out is that with extreme sport athletes, they're actually very, very low. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, it wasn't extreme sport athletes. I want to recall the whole thing, and I'm trying to, but I just know something like people who went out and did things. Oh, so so people who did things like um, uh, research in the Arctic or working on oil rigs and things like that. Um, people who whose jobs pulled them to extreme climates and things like that, they were the least, <laughs> they're the least neurotic and they had the least amount of um, psychopathology. Like it was very, very small, um, very, 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 very small, near non-existent um, things to near non-existent. Now let's turn to the physicist because I always like to talk about the physicist and the mathematician. It was actually very low for the physicists and the mathematicians as well. Um, but the one thing that was interesting that Dean Keith Simonton found out was that for eminent physicists and mathematicians, it was actually much, much higher. And that's where all the mess was, the little percentage and mess was coming from in his entire study. Because, and this isn't something that's, you know, unique to his study. One of the things that people have found out in terms of the scientific or the academic personality in general is that it's far more conscientious than anything else, like extremely conscientious. So these people don't actually experience a lot of negative emotion and things like that. Um, so, I mean, or at least like the, whatever they do, it staves off the negative emotion or something like that. They're not, they don't, it's not where that's not actually true about like all physicists and that's not true of imminent and imminent physicists so and it's something that's different about nobel laureates too people who win nobel prizes in physics so people who tend to win nobel prizes in physics are not purely only interested in physics that's the one thing you don't find and this has something to do with openness to experience i mean i fuck i'll just like keep going with the whole thing look 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 Physicists just know eminent physicists, they're, they have neuroticism and they show psychopathological aspects <laughs> to themselves. So pathology, they test positively for it. Um, okay, now when you look at the performing artists and the visual artists and all the other classically considered artists, except for sculptors for some reason, you're all at risk. <laughs> you're all highly at risk. You guys are all freaking wackos. <laughs> I mean, when I'm saying you guys, I also do <laughs> classically considered creative uh, arts. So I'm at risk too, but I'm just saying like, we're all at risk, you know? So that's what it showed in um, Dean. That's what it showed in Dean Keith Simonton's work. And the funny thing, too, which I don't know if this was Dean Keen Simonton's research, or, uh, maybe it wasn't necessarily Scott Barry Kaufman's either. It has something to do with personality. I just remember reading this. So whenever you're looking at Nobel laureates or people who are at the top of their fields in terms of their domains, one of the interesting things you find is that it's always occupied by conscientious people. But then the other thing you always find is at the very, very top, you find the most open people as well. 
which is something that's very, very strange. So when you look at physicists who win Nobel Prizes, they are far more open than their other um, physics contemporaries or colleagues. And one of the things that Dean Keith Simonton found whenever he was looking at eminent physicists or physicists who won prizes, it's not just the Nobel Prize or whatever, but physicists who won prizes is that they usually did more than one thing, which was very strange. So they did something like publish a book of short stories or write poems. And that's something that you see with um, Einstein and Maxwell. So Einstein, everybody knows that Einstein played the violin, but he also played the piano. So, and he also liked to go parasailing and very, no, 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 he had a boat. So it wasn't necessarily parasailing, excuse me. Um, he had a boat and he liked to fish and um, go out and boat and things like that. So whatever Einstein, Einstein wasn't as narrow as people tend. So that's the thing, what I should say. So a lot of times when people think of Einstein or when people think of Feynman or when people think of uh even Newton, they tend to think that they're these very laser-focused individuals. And that's something you'll hear people say all the time. Well, oh, Newton, he thought about a problem for months and months and months and months on end. And he was laser-focused. So I'll be frank, Newton was an intense, very um, uh, laser-focused individual in certain ways. But Newton also practiced alchemy. Newton was... <laughs> A very interesting Christian, and he practices practiced his own forms of heresy. Who knows how many times he's read the Bible, and who knows how much he liked to read philosophy because that's part of his beef with Leibniz. Leibniz um, take on natural philosophy and what it meant. They got into a little philosophical tiff, tiff about all of that and things like that. Newton didn't seem. Newton was also a part of Parliament, British Parliament. You know, it's just like. He was a lot of different things at once. He wore many, many hats, and he had very many different tastes. And some interesting ones that, you know, people... Newton doesn't seem so rational. That's the way that I would put it. Newton seems as irrational and as strange as any other genius. And that's one of the things that you find with... Maybe if you wouldn't consider them geniuses like Newton... People who tend to win things like Wolf Prizes or people who tend to win, whether you're talking about mathematicians or you're talking about physicists, whenever you're looking at these individuals, they're usually the ones that do the best stuff are usually open. They're very, very, very open. One of the things everybody knows is that they have high IQ, but that's the one thing that is also surprising because a lot of people's, I guess, perceptions or ideas of physicists or something like that is that they're what's represented in the Big Bang Theory or something like that. And just the whole Sheldon Cooper model of a physicist or an engineer is something to do with modernity and our obsession with IQ. But it's not something of a truism from this empirical standpoint. And so, you know, take that for what it's worth and know that in Dean Keith, that all has correlation with Dean Keith Simonson's study of finding that, look, Whenever you're looking at creative people in any domain, it seems to be that the creative people are eh, a little much, much more unstable. You would say that the creative, and that's why I say the creative personality is an unstable one. They're much, much more unstable. So now, having said all that, so that's all the research for the fact that creativity and madness, and there's a lot, there's a lot more. I mean, from a genetic standpoint, people have known for a very, very long time that the same genes that select for schizophrenia and select for bipolar mood disorder, there's overlap between them, also select for creativity in individuals or individuals that you consider highly creative. Now, they're not synonymous or anything like that. There's overlap in these in these things. And there are some very central key genes in all of this. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about FOXP2, which has... Um, something to do with G and intelligence. And so all of these things are related, okay? It's not like you, it's not a clean picture. I just put it like that. Now, can any of these things make anybody say that, yes, creative people are mad or unstable or crazy? Because I tend to think too, when everybody, whenever somebody's talking about madness, they may think that somebody is in the loony bin or something like that. I think madness means, Plato meant melancholy, and something too of instability but 
it's definitely the case that whenever you're looking at creative people from an empirical standpoint on one vantage point of looking at this sort of relationship, I don't know if it was these studies were trying to find these things specifically or what. I don't really know what led to the studies from a genealogical perspective. But I know in terms of the way in which they were done and the statistics and things like that, I can agree, I can agree with them and everything like that. And so, you know, that's what we have to, that's what's there on that frontier, I would say. Now let's turn to the positive psychology side of things. So one of the things that positive psychologists have noticed, have noted, is that creativity and dopamine have a strong correlation. And then two, why do people like to be, why do people like creativity? So, and when, I guess like, why do people like creative breakthroughs? That's the thing that, you know, not only positive psychologists, so this has something to do with biology as well. So people have been trying to understand creativity from an evolutionary standpoint too. So biology and positive psychology converge on this point. Creativity is something of a feature of dopaminergic functioning in the brain. So from a neuro from a from a neurological perspective, but this was something that was first found out by positive psychology and neuroscience no, no excuse me, biologists, and then the neuroscience went investigating, you know, why is this so? Because if you talk to creative people, what they'll say in terms of their insights, how they know that they're right, is that they have a definite feeling of certainty, which is usually um, I guess like colored by a certain set of emotions that usually stem around positive emotion, awe, wonder, surprise, joy, happiness. There's a lot of different positive emotions. Things that Yak Pinksep would say live with the reward network and the play circuit. So, um, or, but not exactly panic, but it's just like, the same thing that makes us, you know, surprise, novelty, all those, all those things. Okay, so um, that's what um, uh, positive psychologists found out, and that's also too at the same time what uh, I guess evolutionary biologists, like or evolutionary anthropologists, posit about why human beings are creative. Human beings are creative because they're dopaminergically rewarded for being so. Um, you know, I mean, and then when we look at our closest ancestors, it's just the case that all primates seem to be curious. And so it has something to do with our tendency to want to discover things and see what's novel in the world, because there is a real dopaminergic incentive to do that. And the brain is drawn towards novelty for the most part. People like surprise and people like fun, new, interesting things. It's why they're gift shops and tourists, you know, and tourist places and things like that. And why people buy useless ass crap all the time. Anyway, so, but that's, you know, so that's part of the reason why at least. And so that's what they found out. So whenever people are looking at creativity from that standpoint, and it's also too from, I suppose, a cultural Western standpoint, that we realize, especially as it pertains to scientific, I guess, like advancement in Silicon Valley, that it really pays to have creative people around, not just, you know, well, also to Europe. I mean, like whenever you look at how much money Europe makes in terms of people traveling to Europe just to see the architecture, people know that beauty matters. I mean, like it just matters. Beauty matters and creativity is very, very much so instrumental in scientific progress and technological innovation and so people care about it and that's part of the reason why there's been so much money given to like understand it i'm pretty sure obama too was thinking about launching a neuroscientific incentive to understand uh actually giving money for um a lot of research and creativity and neuroscience to happen I don't know if that happened. I don't think that that happened, but I'm pretty sure I, I do believe that was something he was talking about. Uh, somebody check the facts on that for me. So anyways, but, you know, so from a cultural standpoint, that's also why it's come into prominence. And so you've had for a long time in, I guess, like self-help things about how to be creative and everything like that. Now, positive psychology is not necessarily self-help, but people who are into positive psychology may also be into self-help because positive psychology has done everything from come up with new fields of psychology and, uh, you know, psychological approach. Carl Rogers would be one of the first pioneers of positive psychology. Abraham Maslow, similar. Um, Boss Winger, you know, Mihai Chinksink Mihai, 
all of them. They're positive. I mean, I don't know if they came up with the name positive psychologist, but they're the ones that the field calls positive psychologists. So, I mean, they're a lot more than individuals that just study creativity, but, you know, they're also more humanistic, I guess, like in certain ways. I'm not sure how you describe it. I mean, it's just like they're all, they care a lot about positivity and positive emotion. It's also where the research on positive illusions came from and, you know, people like Carol Dweck and the growth mindset and everything like that. Those are all positive psychologists, okay? Um, so that's that's what they are. They tend to be an interesting bunch of people, but that's, you know, those are the positive psychologists. So anyways, like here's, here, um, and then they're also the ones that came up with all the uh, stuff about, you know, uh, self-esteem and affirmation and things like that and uh, within children's education. And that's something they're still pushing. Don't think that they're not. Look, I don't know if I've ever said why I don't think a number of uh, constructs in positive psychology, why I think that a number of constructs in positive psychology don't actually exist. I don't know if I've ever done that in a video or something like that. But there are a lot of things that positive psychologists think exist that I don't think exist. <laughs> So, from a scientific standpoint. But anyways, moving on. So they do a lot of things. Not all of it's bad, a lot of it's good. I'm not, not just bashing positive psychology. I don't hate positive psychologists or anything like that. I just feel they're a little narrow or something like that. But anyways, you know, with that research in positive psychology, people also, too, from the standpoint of positive psychology, really spearheaded by Scott Barry Kaufman and Colin D. Young, who is a student of Jordan Peterson, which I would not say Jordan B. Peterson is a positive psychologist. He's, I don't really know what Jordan B. Peterson is. I'm not going to put him in a category of psychologist. I'm just going to leave it like that. But a lot of their work in conglomeration with others have been re-examining creativity from the standpoint of personality and traits. Now, it's the case that Hans Eysenck a long time ago looked at the relationship between um, personality and and IQ, but it's been re-examined. And one of the reasons why it was re-examined is because whenever people were looking at the classical definition or the first definition of openness to experience, people noticed that this thing was basically synonymous with IQ. Um, and that didn't seem right to some people, especially not to Scott Barry Kaufman. So he did a number of studies. And one of the things that he, Colin D. Young, and a few other people showed is that Whatever creativity is, it's not the same thing as IQ. It's just not. So we have to find a new way of understanding it and measuring it. And so does that mean we've misunderstood what the creative person is or who creative people are and things like that? And one of the things that's been overwhelmingly found since the advent of creative um, achievement inventories and a whole host of other things from a personality standpoint where you're looking at people who are highly creative and whenever you're looking at people who, well, so whenever you're looking at people who are highly creative, you just notice that they're all high in openness to experience, no matter what. That's the one thing that's consistent, no matter what field you're looking at. It doesn't matter if you're talking about mathematicians. It doesn't matter if you're talking about writers. It doesn't matter if you're talking about whoever. Whoever it is, if they're highly creative, they're very open. So that's the one thing you can guarantee. Now, because of this, it's the case that people know that creativity is very, very much so something that openness to experience is, I wouldn't say responsible but responsible for, but you are not open, you're not creative. That's just the way it goes. Now, a lot of people don't like that. There's other schools of thinking that think everybody's creative and everything like that. But it's not true. <laughs> so, I mean, just from an empirical standpoint, it's not true. If you're not an open person, you're not creative, you know? <laughs> it's just not, it's not a, it's not a thing. Um, and so, you know, or your levels of openness predict for things that have a lot of association with creativity. Now, none of them directly have something to do with creativity from the standpoint of creative achievement. It's just the case that you notice when all creative achievers are highly open. That doesn't mean that all open people will be high creative achievers, but all high creative achievers are very open people. They're highly open, more open than any goddamn person you'll ever lay your eyes on or something like that. That's how it tends to work. And so that there was overwhelming evidence, I suppose, that openness to experience is 
one of the necessary, if not the linchpin factors of creativity. I just think that positive psychologists stop there. That's my take. That's my take on it. Um, because the other thing that she found was that creative creative achievement didn't have strong um, correlation with not many other um, personality um, uh, traits. And when you sum the fields per se, so when you sum you know creativity across domains, you find that a lot of personality dimensions have negative correlation, maybe what has a weak near correlation to creative. So conscientiousness has the biggest negative correlation with creative achievement. Conscientious people are not creative achievers typically, okay? Not somebody who's hyper-conscientious. Um, at least creative achievements. So Stephen King, for example, is very conscientious, but Stephen King is also very open. You need openness, so that's how I'll put it. So, but it's negatively, conscientiousness is negatively related with um, the things we re relatively associate with creative personalities. Then, next, you find that extroversion is weakly associated. Um, because some, so extroversion is an index for positive emotion. So the relationship between dopamine, risk-taking, and creativity is not exactly sorted out. But that's why I think extroversion has a weak association with it. Then the thing you find is that neuroticism has a negative correlation with creative achievement. Now, that may make you say, well, then, Joshua, why would you say that neuroticism is part of the creative personality? Because I think, like, there's plenty of studies to show that it looks like that. I think whenever you're looking at it from a certain vantage point, it won't look like that because it depends on what you're testing for or what you're looking at. So neuroticism as a trait is something that's connected to, I guess, like psychopathology. But it's not necessarily the same thing as like anxiety or anxiety disorders or anything like that because it has a specific definition as a um, big five dimension. But in terms of the facets that make up neuroticism, Many of them have strong correlations with personality disorders such as depression or various anxiety disorders such that if you were to increase the, I guess, amplitude of these things in this person, it looks very much so like you have one of these other people that have a personality disorder. Now, I'm not saying that neurotic people have personality disorders or something like that. I don't necessarily know the relationship, but I think whenever you do the Ian Keith Simonton study, where you look for pathology and neuroticism, you're going to find a correlation. But whenever you look for just straight neuroticism, you may not necessarily find a correlation because of how you know the statistics um, play themselves out. And so that's my that's my thing. Then I would say too that just from a case study standpoint, that creative people. I mean, and it depends on, and I think it also too depends on the domain that you're talking about. So I don't think that everybody who is like Consider it. So let's talk about mathematicians and creative science. Let's just talk about creative scientists because I mean, this is really who it pertains to. I don't think that all creative scientists are going to be highly neurotic. I don't think that that's true. Um, I think that they're all going to be open, but I don't think that they're all going to be highly neurotic. Why don't I think that they're all going to be highly neurotic is because science is something of an institution. So because neurotic people tend to feel more slighted about certain things. So scientists are offensive people and things like that, where I think that neurotic people tend to be what we classically associate with sensitive. And so sensitive people, you know, and somebody may ask, well, Joshua, how the hell are you able to be a scientist? I'm very disagreeable. So if somebody does something to offend me or upset me, I beat the hell out of them. I argue with them. I do something. I'm a lot more polite now as a, a young adult than I was as a kid, but I can tell you the number one reason I got into a lot of fights is because I'm neurotic and I'm also disagreeable, and I also have a quite, quite a bit of muscle mass, so that, that has kind of something to do with it too, um, and I grew up in an environment that taught violence, so that has something to do with it as well, but I mean, so that's why, you know, I can do science, because somebody can, one, two, I have a very high IQ, so I mean, I'm not saying that that's what allows me, and I'm very industrious, so in terms of when it comes to science, it's very hard for people to criticize me because usually I'm criticizing other people or what they think because, I mean, usually, and I mean, that's been my um, experience so far. That's not to say it's going to stay like that or something like that, you know, when I get to graduate school or something, you know, who knows, I don't know. 
But I'm just saying that my experience so far has been to the case where, you know, the gruff nature of scientists don't bother me because I don't really study with other people and things like that. I'm not really somebody who's swept up in the competition and I've not ever published a paper in physics or anything like that yet. So I don't really know the cut, maybe possible cutthroatness of it all. And two, like, I'm as witty as they come, so you insult me, you better be ready for one back. If I decide to get into an insulting match, so it's just like, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me so much, because if people try to hurt me, I can hurt them, so I don't feel as bad, um, I guess. Though, I'll be frank, I don't like it when people are mean or rude or something like that, it hurts, it hurts my feelings, per se. Or, yeah, I would say it hurts my feelings, it disturbs me. It makes me angry. So that's what I would say. And I know the only reason why it makes me angry is because it feels like an assault on me. Not if somebody talks about my ideas. It's very different. So for whatever, ideas are completely impersonal to me. But if somebody says something about me and my character or something like that, and that's like, oh, yeah, different story. Different story, hard, 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 hard to deal with. And if somebody makes fun of me, then I'm like, now it's not the same because I'm an adult. But tell, I'm telling you when I was a kid, Look, like, maybe you learn new things, but your personality or your motivations don't change. So that's how I put it. Now, when it comes to other scientists, though, I know spending time around them in mathematicians, they're not like that. Now, maybe male and female have something to do with it because women are more neurotic on average than males. And so maybe a scientific disciplines become more, <laughs> I guess, diversified in terms of the sexes you'll see a higher spike in neuroticism or something like that, or maybe it won't have such a weak correlation and things like that. But I think for now, you're not going to see it because highly neurotic men usually kill themselves. And why haven't I killed myself? Uh, that's another video. But trust me, I've tried on several occasions and I've thought about it on several occasions. So it's not like I haven't been there. So it's just a case that, you know, well, there's a lot of reasons why, you know? Um... <laughs> And to, uh, well, so I'll just say that. I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and I think too, from the standpoint of positive psychology, positive psychology is not trying to understand, you know, creative people from the standpoint of what creativity means as a general phenomenon. They're trying to understand creativity as it pertains to people living healthy, organized, productive lives where they find the most meaning and fulfillment and happiness and joy and all of those things. Positive psychology is a study of positive psychology or positive science. How do we make people's lives more positive and in their quality and everything like that? I mean, it's why, you know, there are books from positive psychology, such as The Science of Making Your Dreams Come True or The Science of This or Something. I'm not kidding, these things exist, so, or the science of goal setting, or the science of, like a lot of them, that's, that's all positive psychology. So that's not, that's not, this isn't necessarily the question that they're trying to answer, but because they're not answering this question, and because this question utterly offends their kind of push towards using creativity in a more um, uh, positive light, and due to society's desire for more creative people in it they just don't want to talk about the negative aspects of creativity because creativity is actually not a great or amazing thing from the standpoint of what it means for a person's personality you're not looking at a stable personality and i kid you not creative people are much more likely to experience trauma and problematic aspects with their lives than um, conscientious people in fact that's one of the biggest difference between conscientious people and creative people a relatively conscientious person can be highly successful or look average a creative person is either going to be highly successful or they're going to be an utter loser i'm sorry i mean maybe it's not true maybe that's not true but that just happens to be happens to be more disparate like that for creative people or what people would consider an utter loser or i could say are going to experience a lot of trauma you know unfavorable things will happen to them very much so you know so one of the things that, of why, you know, a lot of times people think that um, uh, ment I'm not saying creative people are mentally unstable or something like that, but there's a reason why there's the expression curiosity killed the cat. 
because there are predators in the world. And so for a lot of the reasons why people with mental um, instability are in um, uh, institutions is because it's not like they're going to harm people, but people might harm them. And not in the ways that you might think. So, for example, we have rapists and molesters and things like that in the world. And if you think women, particularly women with bipolar mood disorder, don't experience more sexual molestation, rape, and all other sorts of things like that than any other group here. I mean, like, that's, you know, it happens to them a lot. And there's a reason why. It's not, I'm not saying it's their fault or something like that, but I'm just saying that it's the case that, look, creativity, and I'm not saying creativity is the same thing as bipolar mood disorder. What I'm saying is this. The reason why women with bipolar mood disorder experience that is, well, is because they're women and men can be predatory when it comes to their sexual instincts, but also because bipolar people tend to be interested in taking risks and living a very edgy existence. You know, whether they're willing to do that in terms of their consciously making choices to do that or not is not the problem. It's the fact that, you know, they are going to find themselves around certain scenes with various things if they're not careful or if they're not receiving medication and going to therapy and things like that. I mean, just being around music scenes and art scenes and things like that and, you know, cocaine and all that stuff. How many people with, uh, I guess, uh, mood disorders that I met that were using and things like that? That was a lot, you know? Uh, um and I'd say that a lot of that, you know, a lot of, and I would say the same thing's true about creative people because creative people are risk-taking and interested in novelty. So I'd say even with myself and the trouble that I've gotten myself into, I didn't get myself into the kind of trouble where, you know, it was the case that... I forgot to do this or something like that. I just straight up did things that you're not supposed to do. Um, so that's the way that, that's how I got into trouble. Look, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to say that. You're not supposed to whatever, 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 whatever. That's where creativity typically leads me because I wonder why and what's going on and stuff and so on and so forth like that and stuff like that. And so, you know, that's where it leads me. That's gotten me into a lot of issues. I also happen to like psychedelics. I also happen to like wine. I also happen to like marijuana. Now, do I use these things in, um, you know, consumption? amounts or something like that no i don't have any issues or anything like that i'm not unstable like that but i also usually don't tell people and there's a reason why i don't tell people like my neighbors don't know that about me or anything like that like maybe youtube does and maybe a future employer now will be able to but i mean i guess i'm being dishonest because i'm just saying that look from the standpoint of how creativity works you are a risk taker and because you're a risk taker you stand to lose and also because you're not the only person in this world that you look, there are predators. And so, I mean, you look at people like Tesla, you look at people like Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix didn't make any money from his career, you know? Well, I'm not going to say he didn't make any money. He spent a lot of it. But I mean, to say this, like, Jimi, money, Jimi Hendrix was bamboozled out of a lot of money by his manager. You know why? Because, you know, people... Or, and you know, a lot of something, so I'm not here with the conspiracy theories or anything like that, but a lot of the music industry in terms of the early psychedelic um, uh, industry was somehow connected involved, and involved with the mob. Now, not saying that this is like true, 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 but I mean, and something too I notice about whenever I'm in music scenes and things like that. There are a lot of shady people around those places. Now, I'm not saying that the music industry and things like that isn't cleaned up or anything like that, but, you know, this isn't Hollywood. It's like, whenever you're in the world, it's just the case that it's funny. They're, it's very, very funny. So, you know, seedy, shady, sketchy kind of things tend to be locked in step with, you know, creative activity. Whether or not you're looking at Edgar Allan Poe or Janis Joplin or whoever. So I'm just saying that, you know, if you're creative, it can be rough. You know, it can be rough. But, you know, that's not to say that creativity necessarily and madness necessarily are synonymous. But 
I think that they definitely have a link, and I think that it depends on several factors, what you're looking at and what you're talking about. So when positive psychologists or other psychologists are citing the research of positive psychologists and other psychologists who say that there is no link between creativity and madness, which you should say is, that's not quite true. The only thing you really can say is that it's inconclusive. So that's my video, and thank you for watching.